Julian Assange has been a refugee in the Ecuadorian embassy in London for the past six years, though he's not been charged with a crime by either the UK or Sweden. He knows that the second he steps back onto British territory, he will be arrested and sent to the US, where he's unlikely to receive a fair trial and would likely spend the rest of his life in prison. Those powerful interests want him to pay. It is a historic test of press freedom. The corporate media, which once profited from him, has now abandoned Julian Assange, and they could face the same threat to their freedom to publish classified information were he to be arrested. Cohen said, quote, as I earlier stated, Mr. Trump knew from Roger Stone in advance about the WikiLeaks drop of emails. In July 2016, days before the Democratic Convention, I was in Mr. Trump's office when his secretary announced that Roger Stone was on the phone. Mr. Trump puts Mr. Stone on the speakerphone. Mr. Stone told Mr. Trump that he had just gotten off the phone with Julian Assange and that Mr. Assange told Mr. Stone that within a couple of days, there would be a massive dump of emails that would damage Hillary Clinton's campaign. Mr. Trump responded by stating to the effect of, quote, wouldn't that be great? During the questioning in uh, Cohen's testimony, Representative Thomas Massey and Cohen had this exchange that I think is extremely revealing and should end this matter right there. Uh, Representative Massey said, you, uh, you said, and this is also in your testimony, in the days before the Democratic Convention, you became privy to a conversation that some of Hillary Clinton emails would be leaked. Is that correct? Cohen said, correct. Massey, okay, was that in, uh, you said, late July? Do you know the exact day? Cohen, I believe it was either the 18th or the 19th, and I would guess that it would be the 19th. Representative Massey, but it was definitely July. Cohen, I believe so, yes. Representative Massey, do you know that was public knowledge in June? This was Mr. Assange, and I'd like to submit this, unanimous consent, to submit this for the record. The chairman says, Chairman Cummings, without objection, so ordered. Massey says, Mr. Assange reported to the media on June 12th that those emails would be leaked. So I'm not saying you have fake news, he's telling Cohen. I'm saying you have old news, and there's really not much to that. Uh, there shouldn't have been much to that. This should have made it an open and shut case that there was indeed no so-called collusion between a member of Trump's campaign, Roger Stone, and WikiLeaks. First of all, WikiLeaks strongly denies that uh, Julian Assange ever had a phone conversation with Stone. On February 27th, just three days ago, WikiLeaks put out a statement on Michael Cohen's testimony to Congress. It says, WikiLeaks publisher Julian Assange has never had a telephone call with Roger Stone was only a matter of knowing in advance, which has been elevated to a crime, knowing something in advance, when the whole world knew it in advance as well. C Craig Murray, who we've had on this show, the former British ambassador to Uzbekistan and an associate of Assange, and WikiLeaks said uh, in a tweet on February 27, quote, anybody who believes that Julian Assange was able to phone Roger Stone from inside the Ecuadorian embassy with neither the GCHQ, NSA, CIA, MI5, or FBI intercepting the call is severely diluted. The combined budget of those agencies is 41 billion US dollars. Michael Cohn's testimony is obviously nonsense. Well, I, I mean, my first takeaway is that Cohen, under highly leading questions from Debbie Wasserman Schultz, he did concede that he had no evidence of collusion. And uh, I think that is a you know very important takeaway uh, from his public testimony. The other piece that is uh, curious to me is that he claims that he was in Trump's office when Trump took a call on his speakerphone from Roger Stone who then said, I just got off the phone with Julian Assange. Now, from all other available evidence, Roger Stone disclaims having ever uh, directly been in contact with Julian. But there are many ways I can explain uh, what Cohen says he overheard, and that is that, you know, Roger Stone was uh, pandering to Trump 
trying to inflate his own importance and value. And what's kind of funny about all this is that it was a Republican who waved a copy of an article from The Guardian showing that Julian had announced in June that he had Clinton emails and would be releasing them. So, you know, Wasserman Schultz was focused on uh, Cohen with dates around the Republican convention, which were in mid-July of 2016. And so this would be, if, if Cohen got it right, uh, Roger Stone phoning Donald Trump to tell him something that we all already knew. We also knew in March that they had emails that uh, that they that they released and that they had information about uh, Hillary Clinton. And I remember hearing about that. So the the voluntary amnesia of the press is definitely astounding for sure. Just to add on well, to what you said, there is also intentional conflation because we have to separate which batch of emails we're talking about. Uh, Hillary Clinton's personal emails from the server that she delivered to the State Department in the most inconvenient form for them to process. Uh, in other words, they printed out emails, delivered hard copies to the State Department that then had to rescan all of those emails in order to put them into a digital form. And that whole process uh, was under the guidance of a federal court prompted by Jason Leopold and his Freedom of Information Act uh, filings that were uh, enhanced with lawsuits. And so as we look back, <clears throat> it's very easy for people to uh, conflate these different sets of emails. And fundamentally, we still have no public evidence of how WikiLeaks received these emails and from whom. And yet the corporate media treats as fact the assessment of the intelligence communities that it was Russian hackers who got it from the DNC and gave it to WikiLeaks. And of course, I, uh, I've been talking to Bill Binney uh, since, uh, these, the, since the hacking was originally revealed. And he uh, is a highly credible source with some evidence, I wanna be clear, uh, he has some evidence to support his conspiracy theory, which, of course, conflicts with the official conspiracy theory, which we're all supposed to just fall in line and believe. And so when we look at the false reporting, such as the claim that Manafort met with Assange at the Embassy of Ecuador, uh, it's a free-for-all. And in the corporate media, <clears throat> unless you're BuzzFeed, uh, there are no demerits uh, for reporting uh, false leads and false stories. And, and so I, I remain uh, where I've been for several years, and that is that Mueller has uncovered uh, what I consider to be many levels of corruption. And Trump is corrupt, and Manafort uh, had his own schemes trying to dig himself out of his debt with Deripaska. The false reporting that Manafort was guiding Yanukovych toward Moscow and not toward Europe and uh, NATO and the United States is a fundamental, uh, not error, it is a, an intentional misleading claim uh, that again, lumped together with all this other stuff leaves the average consumer of news in the United States pretty confused and willing to just accept what the, uh, the consensus views are. And this leaves us, you know, once again, uh, very much untethered to facts, untethered to rational thinking, and subject to the clear uh, manipulation that began with script writers in the office of the Director of National Intelligence. You mentioned Debbie Wasserman Schultz, Peter, uh, talking about the, the email release and Democratic Convention. I mean, she's quite a little bit self-interested in the fact that she was forced to resign as the chairperson of the Democratic National Committee, specifically because of what was revealed in the WikiLeaks dump of emails by Hillary Clinton. Um, 
But I want to ask you this question, uh, based on your knowledge of the U.S. law and statutes, you, can you give us a statute that makes knowing in advance a crime? Because that's what they seem to be accusing Cohen and Trump of, that they knew, and, and we know now that they did not know in advance because the whole public knew in advance, it's really, but they seem to be saying, you knew in advance that these results were coming out. This is the collusion, it's absolutely absurd. They never got the actual emails either. They were just told they were coming out, if that's true. And I think you're right, Stone probably just made that up to make him see something more important. You know, we've, we've got a media circus. We have media malpractice where, uh, you know, anonymous sources and unseen evidence are used to promote these narratives. And, you know, we still see people like Adam Schiff, the Democrat now controlling the House Intelligence Committee, who continues to stoke the idea that Mueller's going to, you know, be pulling the pin on a really big grenade. And... Uh, I, I just think that it's going to be a whimper and that anything that is really uh, important in Mueller's report will be at least filtered, if not completely blacked out, by the new attorney, attorney general, Barr. They got enough to get him. You say, and you, as you point out, they don't want to impeach him, probably for political reasons. They think they could beat him, but they thought that the last time. Why do they need to drag Russia into this? Well, the... And weekly. And WikiLeaks, of course. I got an idea why. I wonder well, what you think. Well, first of all, we, we have to look at um, who dragged Russia into it. It was Podesta. And there is one of the emails that was of Podesta's that was released it is from December of 2015. And it's an exchange with a guy I know named Brent Badowski. He suggested to Podesta that you know, if things went south, they could always blame it on Russia. And so that kind of gathered momentum <clears throat> as the, uh, the DNC leaks that were treated as hacks uh, were uh, breaking into the news. And I think it just became a reflexive fallback position for the Democrats. And as you say, the, the irony is that the that the emails were accurate. Everything WikiLeaks has ever published is accurate. They verify everything before they publish it. It's the government's own words that are crucifying them. You know, this is not a, a traditional type of journalism where you go out and interview people and rely on documents and you try to piece it together and get an approximation of the truth. Uh, uh, this is the absolute unvarnished words of the government themselves in these documents. So why it's so extraordinary that we could read their own words about what they've done, uh, what they're doing, and that's why they want to stop Assange, obviously, because and WikiLeaks, because they cannot get. It's harder for them to get away with this stuff, except that the media has now turned on Assange and WikiLeaks because they are uh, he exposed Hillary Clinton, and the contents of those emails are forgotten and are buried in all of this. It was, well, I lost the election, and let's not talk about what those emails said. The whole thing was about Russia from the beginning, because that's the great scapegoat of the United States during the first and second Cold Wars. Anything that happens that's damaging to ruling interests, you know, blame it on Russia. That even if Russia did hack these uh, emails, and if they did somehow give them to to some cutout, some intermediary to WikiLeaks so that WikiLeaks wouldn't know it was from Russia. It was still true. And it was a service to the American voter in order for us to know what Hillary Clinton was all about. And that confirmed a lot of suspicions people had about her, but also revealed things no one had a clue about, particularly the manipulation of the primary process. When we now have revelations that the top candidate in the Democratic Party cheated her primary opponent, probably out of the nomination, and that he very well probably would have beaten Trump, all the polls showed, and they preferred her because she was running the DNC. It was, it was basically an organ of the Clinton campaign, was not an independent 
organization to fairly set out a primary so everybody can get a chance that the people, you know, the party members who vote primaries decide, then, you know, WikiLeaks has got to be uh, prosecuted. Uh, Julian has to be prosecuted now. It's the ultimate irony that what they revealed was the election rigging, essentially. And then, and not, not only that, but that then they are accused of participating in election rigging by revealing election rigging. I mean, it's just mind boggling when you look at it from a big picture kind of perspective. In general, he really has done nothing to advance the, the collusion narrative. The one thing that he brought up was the stuff about the, oh, he overheard a conversation with uh, Roger Stone. There was, they were talking on the phone with Roger Stone, and Roger Stone said that he, was talk, he had talked on the phone with uh, Julian Assange. The, the problem with, with all of that is that he, none of that means very much. Even uh, Mueller hasn't uh, charged Roger Stone with colluding with uh, Julian Assange. Uh, so, you know, you can talk any, any, any amount that you want about Roger Stone or Roger Stone, you know, he, he had talked to Julian Assange. But why would anyone want to believe anything Roger Stone was saying? I mean, this is a man who is, he's a hustler. Roger Stone was a hustler, much as Michael Cohen is a hustler. He was trying to um, advance his own... Um, uh, cause with Trump. He was trying to show how significant he was to, uh, to Trump, that he knew what was going on. He had uh, contacts, but he, he obviously didn't. And, he was, and, and it's, it's clear also that the Trump campaign didn't really think that he had any uh, contacts. So Cohen really didn't add anything to uh, the, the, uh, the wild speculations because he really... Uh, he, he has no evidence of any extensive contacts between Stone and WikiLeaks because, of course, there weren't. And the, uh, the very idea that Julian Assange would be talking on the phone, on the phone, when he knows that all, all these phone conversations would, would be uh, uh, tapped, uh, that he would be talking on the phone to Roger Stone is just laughable. So it was, it was, a, it was a ridiculous uh, statement by Cohen. Yeah, and if we were on the phone and they uh, had that, we would have heard the tape recording of their conversation. Exactly. So when you say that uh, you didn't advance this. So why is the media going so crazy about uh, Cohen's testimony? Well, that was uh, that's the strange thing that um, I, I'm not sure the media have appreciated just how little Mahler has actually given them. I mean, all of the people that Mahler has indicted. Um, other than the Russians, who obviously will never see, would never be in a British, uh, in, a, in a U.S. court, and will therefore have, you know, none of these charges will ever be uh, tested. But the Americans that uh, Mueller has indicted and convicted, all of them were about, uh, you know, lying to Mueller or lying to Congress. Not one of them has been uh, charged with collusion, which is what Mueller is supposed to be investigating. And so all of, all of the talk about, oh, you know, WikiLeaks this or WikiLeaks that, nobody has been uh, charged with colluding with WikiLeaks. And, and, even, and Mueller has not even advanced any thesis that uh, WikiLeaks was colluding uh, with, with the Russians. So, I, you know, all these Rachel Maddows, uh, who, you know, who, who are peddling all these stories, you know, they're living in a fantasy world. Mahler has given them nothing really uh, to, to, to grasp at. And even when you look at this Manafort, I mean, you know, all this stuff about Manafort and Konstantin Kilimnik, and I don't know how many shows Mada was done on Konstantin Kilimnik, there, there is nothing there. I mean, Kilimnik had worked for 10 years for the International Republican Institute. This is, the, uh, inter this is the institute funded by the National Endowment for Democracy. It is, uh, its president of long, many, many years is John McCain. Uh, you, know, you can't get more uh, you know, regime change committed than the International Republican Institute. That's where Kilimnik worked. He then um, transferred uh, to um, Manafort. And Manafort had spent years uh, in Ukraine um, essentially persuading Yanukovych to distance himself from the Russians 
and to move towards the, uh, the EU and NATO. So that's the enterprise that um, Yanukovych, uh, Manafort, and Kalimnik were engaged in. The, the, the last thing they were doing was anything was advancing uh, Russian interests. But, and, and that's actually, to be fair to Mueller, it's actually in the Mueller indictment. I mean, he, he goes into some detail all the work that uh, Manafort and Kilimnik were doing in Ukraine, and all of it was directed towards pushing Yanukovych away from Russia and into the arms of uh, NATO. So, again, you know, all, all, this, all this people like this, this woman, this empty wheel woman, this... Um, uh, whatever her Marcy name Wheeler. is. Marcy. That's the one. Marcy yeah. Wheeler, yes. Yes, and Marcy Wheeler, who's constantly talking about, oh, you know, this is this is it. It's all going to unravel now with Kilimnik. It's 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 all, you know, the, he, he provided polls to uh, Kilimnik. There's nothing there. I mean, it, it, it's, it is ridiculous. There's no evidence that Kilimnik um, was working for the Russian government. And even um, the judge, the judge who was very unsympathetic to um, Manafort, had uh, said that I don't know whether Kilimnik was working for the Russians. You know, that's what the FBI claims. But uh, you know, I, I've seen no evidence of this. So again, you know, so you know, even this, the judge uh, was who's very unsympathetic to uh, uh, Manafort and and contrarily sympathetic to Mueller says I don't know who Kilimnik was working for. And of course, Marcy Wheeler but I, ignores this and says, oh, it's all about to unravel and the whole thing is about to, you know, the, the walls are, are closing in and so on. Uh, so, yeah. so, you know, the, the media just simply peddling, they're so committed now to this whole Russian narrative that they, they can't let it go. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's... Because it's, they, are, they it's, went out on a limb, limb George. Yeah. They're way out on a limb. They've gone Sorry? out on a. They've gone they've out, gone out on, on a limb. Yeah, yeah. They have to stay out there. They have to find something to back up what they've been saying. They can't turn around and say, "Well, oops, we were wrong." Uh, right. You know, there was uh, there was an attempt by Mueller to link WikiLeaks to the GRU yeah. in that indictment, but as yeah. you yeah. happily pointed out, that indictment will never see the inside of a courtroom. It'll never be tested in. Right. No. Any, no. Anyway, yeah. your agents exactly. won't be arrested. And I think and that therefore, was... you can put whatever you want into indictment. That's right. And, 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 and when... the problem is that the media says that it's a conviction. They don't see it as a, an alleged that's right. crime. That's right. Exactly. Yes. How yes. So that, that's exactly it. And that's why the media often say things like, oh, Mueller has uh, convicted 38 people. The, well, actually, um, <laughs> 26 of them have simply been indicted. <laughs> and so we know nothing about these Russians that, you know, he, he comes up with a whole bunch of Russian names. We know nothing about them. I mean, so we have no idea what they were doing, uh, who they are, even whether they exist, because there's, there's no real confirmation that any of these people actually exist. I mean, you know, he might have just simply pulled a few uh, Russian names out of the, um, uh, the Moscow telephone directory. I mean, you know, who knows? Um, and so when Putin said, OK, you know, if you want us to cooperate with you, um, we'd like some cooperation with you. You know, how about some help on the um, uh, the Bill Browder case? You know, we, you know, maybe you know, if you give us some help on that, we might give you some help on this. Uh, the whole American political establishment was aghast. No, we can't. We're no, we can't possibly cooperate with you on on Browder or on anything. Well, that's it. That that's the end of that. You know, Russians will give no no cooperation, and so none of this will ever uh, be in uh, in any uh, court of law. So. Mala can just accuse anyone of anything. This will be, it will never see the light of day. And he and knows we, very well how the media is going to play it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we yeah. do have people like, I believe it was Peter Dow recently in the wake of that uh, Senate Intelligence Committee uh, bipartisan inquiry, basically saying to date, we do not have any evidence of Trump-Russian collusion. Um, you know, in the wake of that, you have people like Peter Dow saying, I was skeptical of Mueller's investigation from the beginning. And you have just now, actually, um, Renato Mariotti, who is a CNN legal analyst saying, quote, Mueller's report will almost certainly disappoint you. And it's not his fault. It's your fault for buying into Trump's false narrative <laughs> that it's Mueller's job to prove collusion, a nearly yeah. impossible bar to, for any prosecutor to clear. So you have these, these CNN uh, analysts yeah. walking back they're uh, back off the limb exactly back off the limb they've been hanging exactly. off 